Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the second of four webinars we're hosting this fall. My name is Catherine Schulten. And I'm Michael Goncher. And we are both uh, editors at the New York Times Learning Network, and we are both also former high school humanities teachers. Uh, we are thrilled to have with us today uh, op-ed columnist Nick Kristoff, and we are going to get you to him as soon as we possibly can. Right before I turn you over to Nick Kristoff, I want to show you, if you haven't been to the Learning Network recently, this is what our homepage looks like now. Uh, we've been around since 1998, um, but this is the latest iteration, and I show you this one on purpose because it's a screenshot from yesterday, and I want you to know that everything that we say on this webinar is already in a lesson plan that we've published, and you see it right there in the front, 10 Ways to Teach Argument Writing with the New York Times. Anything that we miss, I'll be taking serious notes while Nick Kristoff's talking. Anything that we've missed, we will go back and add to that lesson. So you can just relax and listen, and you don't have to worry that you won't get links or handouts or anything else, uh, because we will have that for you. All right, now I want to go ahead and introduce our guest. Um, first, I want to say that in our spring webinars, we ask everyone, who would you like to hear from from the New York Times in these webinars? And the number one name we got back was Nicholas Kristof. So we're feeling pretty good about ourselves that we got him here. Um, as you may already know, you probably do if you're here, he has been reporting for the Times for over three decades on international issues and has been an op-ed columnist since 2001. He has uh, been, won the Pulitzer Prize twice and has been nominated many more times. And if you can see the picture here, this is a picture from the first Pulitzer Prize he won with his wife, Cheryl Houdin, when they were reporting from Beijing in 1989. Um, and here, I think we have a tiny lag, but here you'll see the homepage of the New York Times from June 4, 1989. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner, there's uh, Nick Kristoff's byline on the Tiananmen Square protest. And then in the streets, anguish, fury, and tears is his wife, Cheryl Wujun's byline. So there you have that. A um, little New York Times history. Today, though, uh, Nick, uh, this lag. All right, here we go. Uh, today, though, Nick writes from all over the world, most recently from North Korea, where you may have read in the Sunday Review this weekend, a long piece about his time, the, uh, the week that he spent there, is that right? Yeah. The week he was there. He also has a couple of best-selling books um, about uh, how to make a difference, Half the Sky and a Path Appears. Last thing I want to say is that if you only follow his columns uh, in the paper, you're missing out because he has millions of followers across social media. He's extremely engaged. Here's just one example from North Korea last week where he has a picture of an elite high school student um, playing basketball and reflects, as he did in his column, that the teenagers there have never even heard of the Beatles or Beyonce. So um, you may want to follow him on Twitter or on Facebook. All right, I'm handing it off now. I'm going to click the slide for you, but um, we are pleased to have Nick Kristoff talk to you about 10 ways that you can write off beds as well. Um, thanks. I'm really delighted to join everybody. Welcome. Um, and, you know, I'd say I was delighted to join you all in any case, but when you're just back from North Korea, hey, you're really delighted to be <laughs> doing this, um, considering the alternatives. Um, I was a little bit nervous uh, the last day or so when we were leaving. Um, so let me just, uh, before I have some very specific points I wanted to make about uh, about how to write op-eds, but... Um, you know, a couple of broader thoughts, you know, why a few reasons why I really wanted to do this. One is obviously to, to help the, the my colleagues at The New York Times. I think that uh, uh, The Times is playing an important role uh, and anything we can do to broaden its audience, I think, is important. But I also think that that it's incredibly important that students learn persuasive writing. It's an incredibly important uh, toolbox and life skill. And I hope that um, our work can be uh, can be used as part of the teaching process for that. And I guess also more broadly, I'm hoping that your students uh, and you um, will indeed uh, take up the challenge and periodically write op-eds. Uh, the, you know, I, I think that you all and your students all have experiences uh, or areas where you were expert in, um, not least education, and you do have something to contribute. And so um, I hope that you'll see this not just as a, you know, as 
kind of generic uh, training, but also will inspire you to uh, periodically and will inspire your students to um, to really try your hand at writing op-eds. And I look forward to your work being published alongside mine at some point down the road. Um, I should also say that, you know, I, uh, as preface to this, that I'm offering some uh, some very specific hints, but um, I've got to say that my own views have evolved. So when I became a columnist in 2001, essentially in the aftermath of 9-11, um, you know, I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to be changing people's minds right and left. And uh, it, it, it really didn't work that way at all. And I found that if I wrote about issues that people had already thought about, like, um, Oh, the Middle East or guns or abortion or politics, then by and large, people who already agreed with me tended to think, oh, what a great op-ed. People who already disagreed with me thought, Christoph's completely missing the point again. And so the challenge becomes how to not just uh, preach the choir, but how to expand the choir and how to reach other people. And I also found that, in a sense, maybe the my greatest uh, power as a journalist and anybody's greatest influence as a journalist is not so much writing about things that they already care about, but rather um, shining a light on issues that are neglected and projecting those issues on the agenda. And I think that's something incredibly important that op-eds can do. Essentially, journalism can be about the heating business or the lighting business. And at its best, I think it's a spotlight that is highlighting issues and areas that are not illuminated and getting people to care about them. And uh, that that kind of spotlight is the first step to getting issues uh, addressed. And um, so um, that's certainly how I see my column um, as a uh, as kind of a spotlight, albeit with a bulb that doesn't burn as bright as it often should. And, uh, and I'd encourage you to think about that. Um, the the my last sort of introductory point would be that you know, I'm going to mention a bunch of specific points, but column writing or op-ed writing is uh, an art, and it's not a formula. And um, so, as columnists, we have uh, we don't have regular editors; we have a, a copy editor who essentially um, makes sure the column fits in print, and uh, if we if we split an infinitive, we'll be told. But if we have a really dumb column, we may not be told. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, so I I recruit my assistant to tell me when I've written a dumb op-ed. And that kind of, uh, you know, she's, she's inexperienced, uh, but she's a reader like anybody else. And I find that that, uh, you know, getting other people to critique my efforts uh, is is really important. And then if, if somebody doesn't understand an argument you're making, then maybe it's not their fault. Maybe the argument isn't as persuasive as it should be. Um, so uh, with that, let me, let me discuss a few, uh, you know, very specific suggestions I have. Um, and the first one, um, as you see, it's to start with a very clear idea in your own mind about uh, the point that you want to make. And I say that because I think often I see uh, op-eds that people have written that maybe start out with one argument and then migrate on to a different argument, uh, or they make uh, nine key points, uh, or they're kind of convoluted. And then if somebody asked me after I read it, so what was the key point in that op-ed, I would kind of freeze and say, well, it was something about such and such. And I really think that, that op-eds work best if anybody who gets to the end of it can uh, very clearly say, oh, it was arguing X. It was making the argument of, of whatever. Um, and if that argument is clear all the way through, then you can have, you can, you know, you can make nine points in the course of it, but it should be uh, be very clear the uh, the argument you're making. And one thing I do sometimes in my own mind is to compare it to a bumper sticker. And that it's not exactly that. I mean, a column 
I call them hopefully it would be about more than a bumper sticker uh, since you have more words. So hopefully it'll be more subtle, more sophisticated, and more persuasive. But in the same way that a bumper sticker kind of focuses an argument and a thought, it's useful if uh, the takeaway from a column is clear and concise in the same way that a, that a bumper sticker uh, is. It helps organize one's thought. Um, and that there's a central point from which all others uh, flow. Then um, let me move on to my uh, second uh, point. And uh, that is that uh, don't choose a, a topic but rather choose an argument. And sometimes I see people who've written op-eds that uh, on topics they know a great deal about, and they've covered the terrain very thoughtfully and explained the context very well, but it feels a little bit more like a, um, a term paper, not an op-ed. And so I think it's important to to remember that you want to focus and make an argument and not just write about a topic. Uh, an op-ed is, you know, is an argument. And that, again, goes to the issue of something that at its root is at times, you know, approaches a, a bumper sticker in clarity. Um, and again, it's not, you know, it's not an issue, but an op-ed really is an argument. And uh, that means that it's something that um, that is controversial or that people can take a, a different point of view about. Uh, if everybody agrees on a topic, then it's probably not going to be a good op-ed. If, um, if you were to write an op-ed saying uh, businesses should obey the law, well, you know, few people are going to say otherwise. So it's probably not going to be that interesting an op-ed. Um, now. If you wanted to make the contrary argument that, that businesses should ignore the law, um, okay, that might be that might be a little more interesting. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to make that argument, but uh, but but if there's a starting point that you can make that uh, many people would disagree with or even be horrified by, then they may feel challenged and more likely to read it. And I, I think that's you know that's a useful way of choosing a uh choosing an argument and um you know if you sometimes i've i've talked to classes where everybody is supposed to write an op-ed or choose an op-ed and some students say oh you know i i don't know what i'd write about one way of thinking about it is what makes you mad what makes you angry or frustrated what do people not get and whatever makes you mad okay that's probably a a good uh a good op-ed argument uh it's good if there is not just a coherent argument and not just facts, but also a certain amount of passion uh, that will come through. The third point I made is is to start with a bang. And you know, <laughs> let me tell you how I how I um, came into this. So when I first started as a reporter at the New York Times, I was covering business. I was writing for the Business Day section, doing a lot about economics, international economics. And I lived on the Upper West Side. I shared an apartment with a friend, and I would take the uh, subway down the Upper West Side to the office. And, of course, everybody in those days, everybody else on the train would be reading the New York Times. And so I'd look around the subway car, and I'd see people getting to, you know, to going through the paper. And then I'd wait for them eagerly to <laughs> get to my article. And then I'd see somebody, and, you know, they would look at the headline. And then some of them would immediately move on and others would begin to read my article and, you know, maybe they'd read a paragraph or two and then you'd just see their eye move on or they'd turn the page and you'd want to grab them and say, I've got this incredible 18th paragraph. <laughs> and of course that, you know, that doesn't work. You really need to, to grab people early on and nobody is going to read everything out there. Uh, and so you're competing for a scarce resource, and that is people's attention. And that's why it's so important to try to begin with uh, with a bang. Um, and I must say that I and I think that a lot of people 
when starting out make the mistake of of kind of trying to clear their throat and ah, well you know this topic and uh that doesn't work you really need to catch people's attention uh right away um and um and i i'd say that one of them i mean i spent a lot of time editing my own columns and rewriting them and one of the things that i focus the most on is uh and that I rewrite the most is is my uh, is the lead the the first paragraph really trying to make it as enticing and coaxing as I as I possibly can. Um, and that again goes to the next uh, point, which is that very often personal stories are incredibly powerful to uh, to make a point and. Um, that, uh, you know, I think I kind of learned this uh, lesson, actually, when uh, I was uh, reporting from Darfur, and this was 2004, and it, it was really frustrating because I would make these um, long, dangerous, and sometimes expensive trips to Darfur, and um, then uh, the... You know, it felt like my stories would kind of disappear without a without a trace. And uh, about that same time in New York City, there were two hawks that were living on the outside uh, outskirts of Central Park, and their apartment building had um, uh, had uh, kicked them out of their nest because of the bird droppings. And so, uh, uh, all New York seemed up in arms about these poor two homeless hawks. And I thought, how is it that I can't generate the same outrage <laughs> about hundreds of thousands of people being slaughtered? And that led me to the work of a social psychologist called Paul Slovic, who has done a lot of work about what makes us care. And, well, personal stories are critical to that. Uh, and in particular, it's often about one individual story that we our brains have evolved to feel a certain amount of empathy for an individual. They have not evolved to feel empathy for a class of people, for a large group of people. And uh, connections are really forged with this emotional uh, link that we have. Uh, after that link is made, then you can bring in, the, and you should bring in, the data and the statistics to, to, to confirm your point. But a individual story is a really powerful way of getting people to care, especially about something that they don't have an experience with or um, or are not intimately involved in. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, in writing about refugees, it's kind of a classic issue that I found where people sort of know they should care about refugees, but, you know, they they've got to be at work in 30 minutes and. Who needs to hear another refugee story? Uh, but if you can bring in a story immediately uh, in a very, very compelling way and then draw people in, then that that will make them care about about uh, 60 million refugees globally. Um, and uh, and so uh, I'd also add that often the most important personal stories are your own. Um, and don't be afraid of using the first person or a friend or something with a, a connection to you. In, uh, in my writing about refugees, I made a lot of, I often cited the fact that my dad was a refugee. And you know, he, wasn't, he didn't have the most exciting refugee story. Uh, but he was my dad. And uh, so likewise, I, I think that telling your own story or your family's story or that of a friend or neighbor, uh, it's, it's a way of getting people to care and it's showing that connection. It's making it more personal. Um, and um, then um, one thing that has really changed in the period since I uh, began writing is that, of course, now we're all writing for the web uh, and there's 
a much greater recognition that persuasive writing isn't just about writing, but it's also about um, photos. It's about all kinds of other accoutrements that are possible now and and multimedia. And, you know, if you follow my work, you know that I very often will travel with a video journalist. In, in North Korea, I traveled with two video journalists. And uh, this is, this you know, look, <laughs> it becomes more complicated traveling with, with video folks. Uh, you, um, you know, they always want to stop to photograph great sunsets. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, we're traveling through some kind of a, dangerous conflict area and gunmen all around us and your video journalist wants to stop to get this great sunset behind a barn and you're you're practically ready to commit homicide yourself <laughs> but um but then you get back and those images and those videos really do help connect uh with with people and i think that's especially true for for younger audiences um and um you know i think we probably don't make enough use of music uh, or, um, you know, or other connections. So to so surprise people and, and think in terms of art in, um, uh, in this column uh, about uh, the, the, the photos, the U S and Saudi Arabia don't want you to see. It's essentially about uh, Yemen and a quite brutal war in uh, Yemen that is, overseen by Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates uh, with U.S. support. And I, you know, I initially I was just going to write a column about that war. But then I thought I came across some photos and I thought that the photos would be a powerful way of drawing people in that. Uh, and that the idea that these are photos that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia don't want you to see would be kind of a challenge to readers. So they would say, well, if somebody doesn't want me to see it, then I'm going to see it. And um, uh, and so photos are really, I think, central to, uh, to storytelling, and that's increasingly uh, true. Um, then um, another point is, um, you know, don't feel the need to be uh, formal or uh, stodgy uh, and Often, I mean, academic writing is indeed more formal, but um, newspaper writing and persuasive writing increasingly has a more um, informal feel to it. And the web, I think, has changed has changed these patterns and made uh, a much more casual style uh, feel more normal. Uh, more, uh, uh, it's, you know, writing is much closer to kind of a colloquial style now than it ever uh, used to be. Um, I'd also, uh, say that I think that one mistake people sometimes make is that they ignore weaknesses in their arguments that, that everybody is aware of. And look, your, your job in persuasive writing, your job in writing an op-ed is, is not to present a kind of on the one hand, on the other hand, analysis of both sides, but you won't be as effective in making your argument if you ignore a counter argument that everybody is aware of and you just seem to not address. And so uh, by all means, raise a counter argument that people are aware of and then uh, and then either show why it is invalid or else acknowledge that, yes, that's a perfectly legitimate argument, but it's outweighed by these various other issues. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that even those of us who are in the professional writing business don't uh, don't do often enough acknowledge that there are legitimate counter arguments, but on balance we we feel they're outweighed by the ones that are more persuasive uh, to us. Um, I think that um, uh, the other point I would I would make uh, is that it's often useful to cite an example of what you're criticizing, to kind of focus the mind, to make it clear um, what uh, the stakes are or what the counter argument is, to personify it so people have an image in their own mind of, 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 um, of what they're confronting, and also to create kind of a clash uh, of views. And uh, so, um, uh, 
uh, in here's another refugee article. Uh, I I cited uh, some of the arguments that people made uh, against uh, allowing Anne Frank into the uh, or or people like Anne Frank into the U.S. in the 1930s. But I've also cited periodically, um, you know, arguments that people have made against refugees today. And I sometimes do that, especially with arguments that that I think will kind of uh, resonate with with readers, and then show why I think that those uh, arguments are, you know, are not relevant. Um, and uh, the ninth point I'd make. Is that this again? I think goes to a mistake that I think we we often make, and indeed that I make. That we often in our op eds we cite the arguments that are most persuasive to us, but those often are not the arguments that are most persuasive to people who are on the fence. And if you want to not just preach to the choir, but expand the choir, but change people's thinking. And you have to remember that the people you're targeting are not are not the zealots, but they're the people who are kind of caught in the middle. And so instead of pounding the table and making a, a maximalist argument, think about how you can lure over people uh, in the middle and think about your use of language, for example. Um, I write uh, a lot about... Uh, well, in, in the example you have in front of you, I was writing about climate change and trying to think what common ground I could find with um, with some climate skeptics. And I I made the point that we had all just watched the eclipse and we had accepted that scientists were right in predicting the moment of the eclipse. We all sort of assumed that the, there really would be an eclipse at the right time. We spent a lot of money traveling to places mm -hmm. and so on. And so shouldn't we also have some confidence when scientists warn of really dire consequences if we continue to pump uh, pump carbon into the atmosphere? Um, likewise, I, I write a lot about gun violence in the U.S. And uh, I, you know, I have I've had plenty of columns uh, making the arguments for gun control. But I, I realized at some point years ago that every time I used the word gun control, I was immediately antagonizing an awful lot of viewers, uh, an awful lot of readers in the middle. And uh, that instinctively, the that term gun control, that was a that was a liberal word. That was a word that was going to lose people right away. And so um, if you read my columns in recent years, then uh, I tend to use the word gun safety. And that's because it's a lot harder to be against gun safety than it is to be against gun control. And if I'm trying to win over people, then I'm trying to be inclusive, making them see my arguments, trying to reach them. Um, and that's um, that's a lot help, more helpful if you're not sort of insulting people right off the get-go. Um, and the final point that uh, I would make is that it used to be that when – an article was published that that was the end. Uh, that was um, that was when the work ended. These days, it's kind of when the work begins, <laughs> and there's uh, the you know the crucial part of actually getting people to read something. And so, uh, I would really encourage you to think about avenues to um, to um, to spread the word, and maybe that's you know emailing your friends or. And getting them to read it, asking them to spread it to their friends, um, and um, it's social media, it's whatever avenues one have. And, and uh, you know, I'm within the Times. I'm kind of shameless uh, at this. I I spend a lot of energy on Facebook and Instagram and uh, and Twitter, of course. Um, and uh, I take a student with me on a trip every year. Uh, win a trip journey, partly to get more interest in some of the global poverty issues that I care a lot about. I have a um, a uh, uh, email newsletter that is uh, mentioned at the end of every column. It's a free newsletter that uh, comes out twice a week in conjunction with columns. And that's also to try to get people to 
read about these issues that I care very deeply about. And so it was a final example of my shamelessness. I would encourage you and your students to sign up for that email newsletter. You can do so at the end of any of my columns. And thanks so much for uh, letting me join you in this uh, webinar today. Okay. Um, rest assured, I will include every link that he just mentioned, including to the newsletter, when a trip is for college students, right? Not That's correct. So anybody teaching um, uh, high school, sorry, your kids have to wait, but you should know about it. Um, so I hope, like me, and I could tell from the chat box that so much of what he just said resonates with the way I know that you're already teaching writing. For instance, the need for an audience to hear you, the, the little story that he told about reading it to his uh, his um, assistant to see if he's saying something nuts or not. How many of us have put kids in writing groups to do that very thing? Um, and, and of course, uh, he started by saying, you do have something to contribute. And the rest of this webinar is really about that. It's about very practical ways that we can get kids' voices out there. That is our job on the Learning Network, and we're going to show you how. So, um, so on our site every day, we come up with a lot of ways to help you teach with the times. That's quizzes, lesson plans, writing contests, con writing contests prompts, etc. I'm only going to have the time to talk about two, but they're the two that really apply best to persuasive writing. Um, the first, if you don't know about it, is our student opinion question. We have asked a question of students every single school day since 2009, so that's many thousands of questions at this point. Um, and we take something that's been recently in the paper and use it as inspiration. It links back to that Times article. So as you can see in the um, little screenshot there, this is a screenshot from late September. It was banned books week. We asked about that. Um, fake news, a perennial. We know that teachers are always talking about that now. Why is race so hard to talk about? That was a, a related to a Charlottesville curriculum we were doing. And the one that got the most attention from kids, hundreds of responses, was about the hashtag take a knee controversy. We had many, many kids weigh in to tell us what they thought. Um, teachers tell us that they really love our student opinion questions because they give that um, that mystical, authentic audience that so many teachers are looking for, where you're not just writing for the teacher, you're writing for the world. Um, we hand read each of them before we post them, and then once they're posted, other kids around the world can read them, can respond to them, can recommend them. They're also very, here's a little Ed buzzword, but they're very low stakes writing, meaning we're not asking for anything formal here. What we are asking for is just for kids to be part of the conversation. So um, sometimes we round all those up in a way that makes it even more convenient for you, we hope. So this is um, one of our little, um, or one of our most popular posts ever, 401 prompts for argumentative writing, because we know that the Common Core asks you to do this. Um, so this is everything from does technology make us more alone to uh, are youth sports too extreme, all things that we hope kids can relate to, each links back to a Times article. Um, there's something in there for everyone. The last thing I want to say is that this year we've started a whole new feature because we're hearing from, we're getting thousands of comments a week on the site these days. Um, and we want to really honor some of that best work uh, in a more formal way. So we have started something called the Current Events Conversation where every week we take our favorite comments that come in on our writing prompts and we call them out by name. So if you participate, maybe your students will be next. The example here we asked recently, I can't read it on my own screen, uh, who should decide whether a teenager can get a tattoo or a piercing? And there were hundreds of kids who wanted to tell us the answer to that question. And they're very surprising answers. They were all over the map. So consider writing in. And now I'm going to take send you over to Michael, who's going to tell you about another feature that is privileges uh, persuasive writing. So in addition to our daily prompts, we also run contests all year long. For example, our 15-second vocabulary video contest and our summer reading contest. Uh, right now, in fact, we are running, uh, well, we're running one contest, which will end on the 17th, our editorial cartoon contest, which is actually a great way for students to make an, art, uh, uh, an argument about issues they care about. This Thursday, we'll be announcing our review contest where students can review books, video games, restaurants, or any type of creative expression that the Times covers. Uh, so go to our contest calendar for more information and dates. Um, perhaps our most popular contest is our student editorial contest. We run it uh, at the end of the winter, at the beginning of the spring this year. It will be starting on the 28th of February. Uh, this 
This past year's editorial contest, we got about 8,000 student entries. Uh, all of the entries have to be 450 words or less, and students have to use at least one time source and one non-time source in their editorials. And in the end, our judges pick 10. So that's 10 out of these thousands, uh, which will get published on NewYorkTimes.com. And we also honor dozens of runners-up and honorable mentions each year. And here's, we just picked one example to show you. Um, this was from our first year of our contest. And, and I think it captures so much of what we love about this contest. We, we want students, I guess like Nick was talking about, we want students to write about the wrongs that they see in the world, whether they're large or small. Uh, so this student wrote about his frustration with the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition and how he thinks it belittles uh, women athletes' athletic accomplishments. His answer, add male athletes in their swimsuits. He grabs our attention, and, and he makes a strong case. Um, okay, now I'm going to quickly send you to meet uh, Cabby Hong, who uh, we met ourselves. He's a high school teacher in uh, Verona, Wisconsin, and we met him because he wrote into us to say, thank you for your student editorial contest. It's kind of changed my curriculum in the spring. Um, never take it away. And, of course, we wrote back and were like, talk to us. And once we got to know him, we invited him to speak to you. So, Cabby, uh, are you there? I'm here. All right. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I teach AP Language and Composition, and every year we write a persuasive essay. I'm always looking for something new for my classes. So two years ago, I had all of my students enter the New York Times Student Editorial Contest, and it really has changed the way that I teach and the dynamics of my classroom. Um, I love the contest for two, re two main reasons. The first is that I think it validates that the everyday concerns of a teenager matter in this world. If you read the news, there are so many big global issues like climate change or terrorism. But if you read the winners from the contest, you see that everyday teenage concerns like too much homework or school lockdown drills matter to the well-respected New York Times. In the past, my students would write about topics that they thought they should write about, like capital punishment or gun control. Um, now the writing is a lot more personal, which is great. The second reason why I like the contest is that I think it energizes my students. Instead of writing about, instead of writing for boring old Mr. Hong, they're writing for the premier news organization in the world. And I really can't tell you how much that changes the dynamics in my classroom. Uh, students want wanted to receive, revise their drafts without me even asking. Uh, they were also on the Times website constantly checking um, to see if they had placed in the contest. And I've never had that experience with any other writing assignment. Last year, Verona High School had, had um, placed six students in the contest. And one of my students, Dinah, uh, placed in the top 10. Dinah is pictured here in the far right. Dinah, would you like to say hi to everyone on the webinar? I'd love to. Hi. Great to see everyone. <laughs> hi, Dinah. Okay, so I thought I'd share two quick handouts that I thought were pretty effective. Uh, the biggest obstacle in this contest is helping my kids find something to write about. Uh, I can't tell you how many kids tell me that they have a really boring life and they have nothing to write about. Um, so what I like doing is I like modeling the process myself by showing my students what I would write about if I had to enter the contest. So on the handout that's on your screen, um, I have the kids start with what makes them mad, uh, just like Mr. Kristoff said earlier. Uh, I haven't found a teenager yet that isn't mad about something. So I then um, have them talk about what they're struggling with, because uh, you know teenagers are always struggling with something. And I share with my students that I was the only Asian American student in my high school growing up, and I really struggled with my own racial identity. And I'm pretty open about that with my students. And I think that was really powerful for um, my students because two of the students that actually placed in the contest, Rikini and Amelia, they also decided to write about their Asian American identity. And I think it was because um, I was willing to kind of talk about it myself. OK, so the next handout is a revision activity. And I think all English teachers struggle with what to do after the students have turned in their first draft. Um, how do you make it better? Most students think of revising as simply fixing commas and spelling errors. I pulled examples from winning student editorials and looked at the stylistic choices that the students made that worked and really resonated with me. 
I looked at their use of syntax, diction, and other rhetorical devices that they used. I also used examples from the great Martin Luther King and told kids to copy the techniques, like his use of metaphors and rhetorical questions. Um, the next slide is talking about um, the Nicholas Kristof, and it's surreal that I'm on this webinar with Mr. Kristof because <laughs> I use his ed editorials all the time, and he's a personal hero. I'm flattered. So this, this is a <laughs> he fantastic He described this one to me as perfect for teaching, right, Cabby? Perfect. <laughs> oh, this is, a, this is an absolutely perfect editorial, and I love this one because, uh, first of all, look at, the, look at the headline. If Americans love moms, why do we let them die? And you just want to read it. And what I love about the editorial is it's a very heavy topic, but it's a very interesting editorial, and I think even teenagers could really get into it. It's balanced in its use of logos, pathos, and ethos, and it's really stylish. There's some really interesting ways that Mr. Kristoff uses, you know, sentence structures, rhetorical questions that you can use with your, with your students. So I'm now going to turn it over to my student, Dinah, who um, wrote about school lockdown drills, and I thought she could just talk about her process here. All right. Hello, everyone. So yes, my name is Dinah Kalina, and I'm currently a junior at Verona Area High School, and I'm really excited to see everyone. Um, it really warms my heart that so many people are listening in. So my edit uh, editorial topic for last year's contest was related to level three lockdowns that are performed a handful of times each year in schools nationwide. And so its main use is to parry what could be an active shooter. So like as, I, uh, as a student, I began to realize that these lockdowns fester this sort of nervous, nervous atmosphere when they occur. You know, students and my friends, you know, they get scared and afraid. They want to know what's going on and usually can only react by just messing around with friends, texting others, trying to figure out what was going on just overall kind of chaotic. Um, and so I thought to myself, if no one feels safe during these secure, uh, safe and secure during these drills, what, is, what if the real thing happens? Now, I adore my school. Um, the administration and staff here, they're just beyond friendly and welcoming. I'm in love with all my dear friends in the community that is withstanding here in Verona, Wisconsin. But you hear it every single time when a school gets shot up. You'd never think it would happen here. So this spoke in like enormous volumes to me and I know that each um, and every one of you out there who teach at schools or are part of a school community know that you know you adore where you are so as I wrote this editorial which um, I'll actually read off for you right now um, it has become very familiar for high school students to practice the infamous level 3 lockdown and in all cases we all share the semi-nervous trickle of well maybe we get Swiss cheese today and sit in a corner stare at our phones and their friends. And only very recently, after a vivid dream, moreover a nightmare of a school shooting, did I realize that sitting in the dark and stopping bullets with locked doors and silence is the exact opposite of, one want, of what one would want to do. It wasn't until I stumbled upon the fact that the people shot and killed in the Columbine Library sat there for five minutes before the shooters entered and shot them. My school is full of able-bodied kids and surprisingly a great chunk of that has had experience with self-defense and even marksman training. So why sit and wait? Um, so you see uh, that this um, meant a lot to me. And I'll uh, bring it back over to everyone else. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dana, a comment came in while you were reading that you should know about, because I don't think you see the chat, where a teacher said, I actually taught with your editorial. Uh, to show other kids what to do. So there you go. Okay, uh, we are taking no time with this because I know that you guys want to ask questions. We've saved 10 minutes for questions for anybody on this panel, but I'm sure you have a lot for Nick Kristoff. Yeah. Um, again, that's the lesson plan. I'm going to update it the second this is over. So go ahead. Um, Tony, have you got questions for us? There is no shortage of questions, lots of questions for, for Nick Kristoff. Um, here's the first one from Matthew Neal at IASD. Mr. Kristoff and all the hosts, how would you suggest civics and government teachers and all teachers encourage critical discussion and engage with current events while maintaining neutrality with students considering the, the current political environment? Start um, here. Okay. Um, you know, look, this is obviously uh, a challenge given that everything is so polarized. Um, but I think it's perhaps not impossible. I mean, perhaps one 
uh, one approach is uh, to give a couple of different examples on a topic uh, from different perspectives uh, so that it doesn't feel as if the teacher is, you know, so nobody can accuse the teacher of force feeding a particular view onto students. Um, uh, you know, or maybe it taking a argument and then inviting students to critique it and to come up with counter arguments and look at what the op-ed writer missed uh, or, you know, what what an effective counter argument would look like if one were to respond to it, if one were to write a letter to the editor or whatever it may be. But I, um, you know, I, I, I do acknowledge that this is a obviously going to be something on the minds of teachers and is going to be a an important issue. Um, I hope, though, it doesn't keep hot button issues out of the classroom because I think that is part of an education, and I think that's also part of a robust civil society. Yeah, I, I don't want to add too much more to that except to say I think that's what we devote our site to every day. Last year during the election, of course, we didn't know the outcome at the time, but we ran something called the Civil Conversation Challenge. You know, we we never stop running contests. That's all I can tell you guys. We enjoy them because we're former teachers who miss our students, I think. But anyway, um, we put five forums up, guns, uh, immigration, uh, race and gender, identity stuff, uh, climate change, and then there was an open forum for kids to suggest their own. And the goal was for kids to come on and argue with each other in a civil manner on our site, which I know is very different than doing it live in the classroom. But we had a lot of interesting takeaways from that. and. Um, I'm just going to end by saying I wrote the question down, and I wonder if we shouldn't post it on our site and just invite people to write in answers. So thank you. Um, All right. No shortage of questions here. So students, this is from Judy Freeman at Boston Latin School. Students also often feel that they are not experts or well-traveled but care passionately about issues. They question whether they can write persuasively about something that they do not know or have, have experienced firsthand. What would you say to them, Nick Kristoff, in response? And then just on a side note, uh, she took a number of them two years ago to hear you at Harvard, and they were inspired. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I do think that there is a point to thinking about areas where one has expertise. And I think if I wrote a column about, um, um, I don't know, what high, what high school students think or something, then one might indeed be somewhat skeptical about my expertise on the topic. So I I certainly think that students, if they're passionate about an issue, then they, you know, should should engage in issues, uh, I mean, mass incarceration. So probably not a lot of students spent much time in prison, but this is certainly a huge issue for the country. And if they care about it, then, then that's great. But I think sometimes there's a tendency to think that the grand issues of the country are somehow more important or more appropriate for op-eds than the micro issues that students do have more personal experience with. And, you know, there is nothing wrong with those smaller bore micro issues. And the fact that students do have expertise on them in the form of personal experience, in the form of sometimes bitter experiences, uh, you know that's that's a strong point. So um, you know how how high school boys and girls interact uh, and issues of dating uh, or issues of of sports or accommodating um, trans students perhaps or whatever it may be. Uh, you, you know they're suspending students versus other things. I think that um, I think that there is no reason to shy away from some of those micro issues that students are not only passionate about, but also have really useful experiences that they can really bring something to the table with. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Would you consider taking a school teacher with you on a journalism trip? Uh, yes. And this is from <laughs> Evelyn Lasky at Madison Country Day. Uh, I see. So, uh, uh, so twice I have uh, taken uh, teachers as well as students. Um, one time uh, to the Congo, um, a teacher called Will Oaken, who was also a terrific photographer, uh, in addition to a student. 
And then uh, another time, uh, a teacher from uh, New Jersey uh, who uh, has, and they, in both cases, they blogged and wrote about the trip uh, in addition to the students. And, and both were fabulous uh, travel partners. Um, and they, uh, I think their teaching experience really enlivened uh, the trip. I I haven't in the last few years, uh, but stay tuned. I may again. All right. You heard it here. Um, another question, and this is actually for all the panelists, and this is from Karen Zor at the Heschel School. In this particular political moment, when NFL players are threatened by our president, it is difficult for teachers to express their opinions. This has had a chilling effect on public writing. There have been many times when parents have pushed back when asking students to respond to controversial issues. What do you recommend? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm searching for a link. Um, go, ahead, go ahead, anybody else? You know, um, look, you all know the terrain better than I do and what the red lines are. Uh, and so I'm, <laughs> I think this is an example of an area where I don't really have the expertise to, to advise. But I, you know, I, I recognize this is an issue and I think it's really unfortunate just because there are, I do think that robust discussion and indeed robust disagreement is good preparation for society. And I think that making classrooms uh, sterile of these kind of debates is not the, the solution. But that's very easy for me to say because I'm being paid to be disagreeable. And, <laughs> and you know, that obviously that's not the case in, in other uh, contexts. Um, I, I went to a small rural high school in Oregon where people were periodically getting in um, immense trouble with the... Uh, and fired with a, from the school board, one, including one teacher who uh, initially got in trouble because I think he was perceived as a little bit too liberal, and then he had a beard, and so there was a policy, no beards for for teachers, <laughs> and then he put a, a sign, he shaved, but then he put a, a, a poster on his wall uh, with uh, something like, thou shalt not have beards, and then pictures of a bearded Jesus and various <laughs> other figures, <laughs> then that, that led to his suspension. Um, so I'm certainly aware of the constraints. Um, and um, and I, I think it's really unfortunate if, if people become, if people self-censor because of these concerns. I mean, two thoughts that come to mind are, I think it can be really helpful at the beginning of a sensitive conversation to establish some ground rules mm -hmm. with, with students. But in the end, we want students to have a civil conversation. We want students to feel safe in the classroom. We want it to be a place where they can express their opinions, but where they're not putting other kids down. So I think that, that feels really important. And then, and maybe this is obvious, but uh, for, for me, what's really important is to help students think critically about issues, but not to tell them what to think about the issue, um, and that a classroom is a place to have a forum uh, about complex topics. Now, it's can get tricky if certain students have issues that uh, are have, have opinions um, that that don't contribute to that environment. Uh, so I understand that it, that it is difficult terrain, but um, but it's important. Yeah, it feels a little like our job now. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had a, another teacher on for another webinar who said that she had had good luck just getting uh, parents in to talk to them about their concerns and. You know, meeting somebody face to face and airing concerns is always a way to go, as opposed to you know thinking the liberal the guy's too liberal because he has a beard. Like maybe a, a conversation can help break that sort of thing down. But again, we're sitting safely in a cubicle right now, so <laughs> easy for us to say. Um, I'm afraid it's 5:01 yeah, p.m. Out of time. And I know there's still questions. Um, We'll try to respond to them as, as quick as we can. Um, and again, if you're watching this on demand, we capture those questions too and we'll respond as, as quick as we can. Um, and I'm going to update that lesson plan like tonight uh, so you can have all these links. So if you enjoyed this webinar, oh. just a few things. One is uh, please share the link with your colleagues or anyone else you think would get something out of it. Uh, it will be available on demand and people can watch it and you, get, you can get certified by watching it on demand. It doesn't have to be watched live. Uh, and also, uh, it's important to note that we have a, another webinar, the third in the fall, and that is going to take place on Wednesday, October 25th. These times demand the science times, uh, New York Times reporting in multimedia and STEM classrooms. So we hope that you will join us then and you'll let your colleagues in your schools uh, know about this as well.
Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much.